Good morning. Good to see you all. Good to be here, isn't it, to praise God uh, and to worship Him. We want to let you know there's some things coming up in the announcements. Uh, this is the week that we get to eat. So, woohoo! Um, tomorrow uh, is uh, Culver's Night, so we invite you to come to Culver's between 5 and 8 and support our mission team by a uh, percentage of what the total sales that day goes towards our mission, our Honduras mission team. So uh, please come to Culver's tomorrow night. And Adult Night Out, today is the last day for reservations. So if you want to come to Adult Night Out, um, it's a great Italian meal um, on Saturday. So if you um, want to come, uh, the reservation is up, uh, information is up here at the information area, uh, or see me or Donna would, would be able to do that also. And coming up in April, the week of Holy Week, on April the 2nd, we're going to be doing a Passover Seder meal for our Monday Thursday service, um, April the 2nd. So it's a blue insert that's in your, it's in your bulletin. And we just kind of want to know a number of, like, how many are coming so that we have enough tables and enough uh, places set. So go ahead, take that out and um, take your pen out. There, if you don't have a pen, there's one in the little um, registration pad there at the end of your pew. Go ahead and, and get your pen out and put your name on there that you're coming. Tear that off. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Get your, your name right there. And you tear it off. And then you're going to put that in the offering plate. Do you, everybody have a pen? Anybody need one? You found one? Okay, put your name there. Put it in the offering plate. Tear it off so that you remember April 2nd. Um, it's a great... Uh, opportunity for us to pass along the faith um, to one another by doing that. And um, so other things are coming up are in the bulletin, but uh, Miss Amy, she has some announcement about Vacation Bible School. Yay! Here it goes on the Go screen. On the screen. Hey, there's only one spot left. For what? For the VBS sign-up. I wanted to sign up for that. Could you take me? Church is real close. It's all mine, buddy. <laughs> Come on. Open it. took the last spot on the volunteer sign-up sheet. Oh no, there's always more room for volunteers at VBS. <sighs> Should we tell him? Nah. Well, VBS is coming this summer, June 28th through July 2nd. And we would love to have you volunteer. Don't go to those extremes because we have plenty of room right now. So let me know, Donna Ullman, um, Yvonne Cole, or Susie Brown, and we'd be happy to place you on our list because we need lots of volunteers in so many ways and capacities. So be praying about that and let me know. Thanks.
And now as your hearts, as your hearts are open to worship, let us give our all to the Lord and stand as you are able and join with me in the first hymn. instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Let us sing.
I invite you to pray along with me. Precious Lord, as we face the big decisions and critical events in life, we cry out to you, Savior, lead us. As we look to the future and imagine your perfect will, we ask you to be our vision. Our eyes are on you. Amen. The prophet Malachi once chastised the people of God for bringing second best sacrifices to the temple. So as God help us, we bring our best, the best possible offerings to God. We invite the ushers to receive our morning tithes and offerings.
that you would use these offerings, that you would use the best of what we have given, and that your will would be done. Lord, help us to give the best of our own lives also, so that the love of Christ may ring out into the world. In your name we pray. Amen. You might be seated. I want to remember those that have been in the hospital listed in the bulletin and others, but also lift up to God your joys this day. Let us turn to God in prayer. Lord, we turn to you and we offer prayers for the big events that are in our lives. Things that are coming up, that are looming before us. And we ask that we would be able to turn to you and hand them over and that you let us know that you are in control of these things. We remember how the big events in our lives, we've turned to you. We've offered up our prayers, and you have heard them. Lord, sometimes those big events mean a change in health. Sometimes those big events means a change in the way we live our lives. Lord, help us to be able to, to do the, your will, whatever it is. Help us to be able to change. Help us to be able to focus not on just the things that are here in this world but the way that you want us to live because it's your will so that you might be glorified. May all that we do glorify you. Lord, help us to give our best. Help us to give our best, not just of possessions, but help us to give our best of our lives to you. We thank you for this opportunity to, li to be able to worship you here in this place. What a wonderful, glorious place to be. But we're also lifting up to you the future of our church, where the direction that we're going. And we ask that you would give us the vision. We need more room to make disciples. But Lord, we can only do it with your power. Lord, we need to be able to turn to you in the little things and in the big things. And now we turn to you and ask that you would just hear what is upon our hearts, the people that we're thinking of that need health and wholeness. We lift them up to you. And then finally we lift up our own selves and ask for wholeness. And this is only available when we have been forgiven of our sins. And so we ask that, Lord, whatever we have neglected to do, that you would forgive us. And whatever we have done that has not glorified you, that you would forgive us. We turn them over to you, these sins. We ask that you would remove them so that we may be close to you, that we may be doing your will. Forgive us. Help us. Lead us. Lord, you are amazing in your grace. And we are so grateful. We offer this prayer and the prayers that are on our hearts in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. One more announcement, if you'd take out uh, this piece of paper and look at it. See it? You see it in your bulletin? In Hebrew, right above a napkin-covered stack of matzah bread and next to a cup with the Star of David on it, you see the word pasach. That's Hebrew for, for suffering. Suffering. But don't let that steer you the wrong way. Even though we must talk of the suffering of our Savior, Jesus, this is an evening celebrating the deliverance of God's people from bondage in Egypt in the Old Testament. And it is the Jewish way of teaching their children the story of the Exodus the plagues, how, how God delivered the people of Israel from bondage. And then it was the service at which Jesus chose to identify his body and his blood as certain parts of the Passover service. So please, just consider coming. There's, you don't have to do anything. But uh, if you're willing to read a little part, check that book. And then put your names down because we're, we're going to try to have a place for everyone at a table. And you can share in a Passover Seder on Monday, Thursday, this Easter Holy Week. Everybody got that? Say, I got it if you got it. Ready? Awesome. Praise God. The choir's anthem was especially appropriate. Um, it matches both the stained glass window from the old church, which you can see over there. It was front and center in the old church in a rose-type window. But the anthem that Amy picked for the choir um, contains these words. Wait with me and watch with me. The moments are fleeting. Darkness has descended, and my hour is at hand. My hour is at hand. The Gospel of John contains a repeated refrain for the first 12 chapters. For the first 12 chapters, and you can see it over and over again, maybe four or five times, comes the words, and John speaks them as the writer, the narrator. John says, my hour is his hour, meaning Jesus' hour, had not yet come. Again and again and again. Jesus' hour had not yet come. But then at a certain moment, the moment of our scripture actually, at a certain moment in John 12, everything changes. And Jesus himself says, My hour has come. What hour is it? the hour of his death, the hour of his work of salvation. And what was it that triggered the change from his hour had not yet come to his hour had come? It was Philip and Andrew bringing some strange people up to Jesus to meet him. Philip and Andrew brought some Greeks, the Bible says, to Andrew or to Jesus to meet him. Now, Greeks is code language for non-Jews. He was bringing some non-Jews who loved the law of Moses and were fascinated with this Jewish prophet they had heard about named Jesus. And so Philip brings him to Andrew, and Andrew says, let's take him to Jesus. And they announce to Jesus that Gentiles, like us, most of us, Gentiles, 
want to see you. And Jesus stops everything and he says, My hour has come. My hour has come. In rapid succession, Jesus does two things. He speaks a word about life and death. His own and ours, which we'll hear a bit later. And then he prays. I'm just going to read the prayer right now. Uh, but in, in the midst, listen for uh, an important four-word prayer that Jesus prays as he enters his passion, as he approaches the biggest event of his earthly life. Hear the word of the Lord. John chapter 12, verses 27 to 29. Now, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. This is the word of the Lord. What do you say? You, Lord, come. Guard my mouth. Guard our, our minds and hearts that this word might enter in, that your word might be like seeds planted in our hearts, that your word might grow and bear fruit in the way we live our lives, the way we pray. For it's in your name, Jesus, that we ask it. Amen. We're looking at the prayers of Jesus and this message is entitled, Praying Before Big Events. Praying Before Big Events. It's not unusual, is it, for people to pray before big events, even if they aren't religious, right? Are you, are you there? Yeah. The old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes, is not entirely untrue. I remember vividly some of the prayers I prayed before I received the gift of salvation, before I committed my life to Christ. I, I remember praying before tests, especially the ones I forgot to study for. I remember clearly praying in a hall outside the room where I was to audition for some summer theater. I remember clearly praying in the wings before a performance or praying before a recital or praying before what they called juries at the School of Music. That's when you have to sing your tests or play your tests in front of a panel, a jury. <laughs> Scares me just to think of it. I prayed, even before I was a Christian, I prayed about those things. And I remember... I remember earlier, when I was younger, praying before Little League games. I also remember that it didn't do much good. It wasn't, wasn't very good. Praying before big events. Since becoming a Christian, praying before big events has become more of a habit, probably because I'm praying more in the in-between times. It's easier, more normal for me to pray around the big events. What, what are the big events of your life? What are the things that drive you to your knees? Big test at school, like for me. A big game, if you're an athlete, right? A big match. Or a big musical or concert or play for people like me. Maybe it was a job interview that drove you to your knees. Maybe it was your marriage that drove you to your knees. I, um, 
for now almost 40 years, every time I've had the opportunity to do premarital counseling, I've always made the assignment. I don't know if they've actually taken it or not, but I've always made the assignments. I know Greg and Emily did. They take, I've given them the assignment to practice praying out loud together as a couple. To start by thanking God for each other and then graduate to asking God for God's help during the course of their married lives. I remember, well, here's why I, picked, I got to pick out the hymns, right? I picked out these two hymns today because these were the two hymns whose words I prayed before Becky and I got married. It, it was the two hymns we had as a part of our wedding. Becky walked in to Savior like a shepherd lead us. And we had a friend sing, Be Thou. We changed the words to our vision to make it plural for two people. But that was our heart's desire, that the Savior would lead us all our lives long and that Christ would be our vision throughout our life and ministry together. What drives you to your knees? What are the big events of your life? Maybe it's the birth of your child. Oh, I hope, I hope that drives you to your knees. I hope that causes you to pray. Not just when we dedicate or baptize that child, but as you're awaiting that child's emergence from the womb. How about your kid's first day at school? Pray over that? Hope you did. Hope that drove you to prayer. How about your kid's wedding? Most recent one here was the Gregorich's wedding. That was pretty awesome. Pretty wonderful. I bet you Kim and Brad did a lot of praying leading up to that wedding. Don't you suppose? Maybe it's the birth of your grandchild. Big events are the happy, those kind of big events are the happy things that drive us to our knees. But what about the big events that aren't so happy? What about an emergency that confronts you along the way? The loss of a job, a sudden diagnosis, a death, a broken marriage, a hidden sin that comes out into the open. What are the big events of your life? What's driving you to your knees? What's leading you to prayer right now? Just because so many of us prayed before big events, before we were saved, doesn't mean that it's wrong to pray for big events after we are saved. For me, the difference was simple. After becoming a Christian, the big things, the emergencies, the oh no's and the hoorays of life were not the only things I prayed about, thank the Lord. And also, my prayers for those big things changed ever so slightly. We know that it's not wrong to pray before big events because God's people always have. Moses prayed mighty prayers at times of crisis in the life of Israel. And both David and Solomon prayed mighty prayers before building the temple in Jerusalem. We're praying about what phase two is going to look like. Now listen, when David prayed before building the temple, God said, wait. God said, not yet. Interesting, huh? We're going to let your son do this. And then when Solomon prayed, God said, yes, go for it. And then Solomon prayed the most mighty prayer at the dedication of the temple. Interesting. We need to have ears to hear what God is saying to us in our building as David and Solomon did in the building of the temple. Here's a wonderful prayer that King Asa prayed when Judah was under attack and before they confronted the enemy in the field of battle. Listen. As Asa cried out to the Lord his God, O Lord, there is none like you to help. 
between the mighty and the weak. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. Second Chronicles 14.11 And what's more, we know it cannot be wrong to pray before big events because Jesus did. Jesus prayed and fasted before entering the ministry. He did it for 40 days in the wilderness. We commemorate that time during Lent. Jesus prayed before choosing the twelve. We looked at that in previous weeks. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them. Jesus prayed, we learned another week, before feeding the 5,000. Barb Howard was here at the first service. She's one of our one of our kitchen people, I said, I bet you even, I bet you Barb Howard prays before a big meal that she's in charge of here at church. Jesus prayed before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Listen, so they took away the stone, then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. John 11, 41 and 42. And finally, Jesus prayed before his sacrificial death. Listen again. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. With this mighty four-word prayer in mind, Father, glorify your name. I want to talk to you about three ways to pray before and around big events. First, pray Pray for a good outcome. Father, save me from this hour. That would have been a prayer for a good outcome. This first sounds, however, as if Jesus is poo-pooing the sort of prayer that prays for a good outcome. Verse 27 says, again, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. But don't let's forget that that is precisely what Jesus would pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. In that picture, in that picture. Father, remove this cup from me is the exact equivalent of Father, save me from this hour. It can't be wrong to pray for what we think might be a good outcome if Jesus himself did it. Did you hear that? It is not wrong to pray for good outcomes. Jesus did. He prayed for the good outcome of being set free from having to drink the cup of his tortuous, horrible death. Father, remove this cup from me. If he prayed it, it can't be wrong for us. Second, pray for God's glory. That's the prayer Jesus lands on in John 12. Father, glorify your name. Ultimately, it's not whatever we think might constitute a good outcome that we seek. Rather, it's God's best outcome that we want. And that is precisely what Jesus means by praying for the Father's glory. It's like saying, Father, regardless of my prayer for what seems like the best outcome, that is my healing, my deliverance from these wicked, bad people, and, from, and for my personal safety, I want what glorifies you, Father, the most. 
My favorite biblical example of this is not precisely a prayer, but I think it, it assumes that some praying had been going on. You remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember that? And the fiery furnace? You remember the story. Sad sack, my sack, and to bed we go. You've heard of them? Right? When they were threatened with the fiery furnace, if they refused to bow before this 90-foot statue of gold in the form of Nebuchadnezzar, they say, and I'm going to narrate it as I go through it, they say, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this manner, in this matter. It's like saying, we've already prayed about it. We know what we need to do. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and deliver us out of your hands, O king. We've already asked him for the best outcome. And he can do it if he wants to. But if not, that is, if God says no to our prayer for a good outcome, be it known to you that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. For our God might have something better in mind. Our God might have our sacrificial death in mind. Or our God might have a miraculous deliverance in mind. Let's say God calls a person or a family into a dangerous place in the world to live the love of God and share the gospel of Jesus. They and we would pray for good outcomes, wouldn't we? Are you there? Wouldn't we pray for their safety? We should. Wouldn't we pray for many souls coming to salvation in Christ? Wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? But over it all, we would also pray for God's glory. And if God's glory is served by what we might call a bad outcome, then God's glory it is. As Luther said, the body they may kill, God's word abideth still. And this is precisely what Jesus said just after learning of the Greeks and before praying the prayer we read, Father, glorify your name. Listen, Jesus replied, the hour has come, there it is, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whatever, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. John 12, 23-26. You see, Jesus understood clearly what is often murky at best for you and me, that the good outcome he desired, that the good outcome he would pray for in the Garden of Gethsemane, that is deliverance from having to go through the pain of the cross, the good outcome he desired, he understood, would be trumped by the glory the Father and Jesus himself would receive through his sacrificial death and resurrection. And aren't we glad that Jesus understood that? Sometimes, not just for Jesus, but for us, sometimes the bad outcome we feared is the best outcome for the glory of God, just as it was on the cross. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, Jesus said while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So how do we know the difference? And that's really a wrong question. I say pray for a good outcome and then pray for God's glory, understanding that God's glory may trump the good outcomes we want. And then over it all, pray the prayer 
of relinquishment. Father, not my will, but yours be done. That's the prayer Jesus prayed in the garden. That's the prayer we can pray and mean. Jesus' last great prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, after asking for a good outcome, Father, let this cup pass from me. In that prayer, he relinquished his humanly perceived good outcome into the hands of the Father who had a far greater outcome in mind. One that walked Jesus through the valley of the shadow of death. One that required him to fall to the ground and die like a kernel of wheat but one that would also spring him up to new life on the third day and spring him up to victory for us, for you, and for me. Do you remember the immediate answer that Jesus received when he prayed? I'll read it again, verse 28 and 9. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And will glorify it again, meaning my name. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. And Jesus goes on to say, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Praying for good outcomes is good and right. It's okay. Jesus did. So can you. Praying for the glory of God is better. Layer that prayer right on top of your prayers for good outcomes, all right? But praying the prayer of relinquishment praying for God's best, praying for God's will, is the icing on the cake. It's the best of all. We can tell from this vantage that it was the best of all. Just think, think of it. If you had here, if Jesus, Jesus had his own horrible suffering and death, and then in this hand, He had salvation for the world, for all who believe. When he said, Father, not my will, I don't want to die, but thine be done. He was offering himself up for the greatest work of salvation, for the benefit of the world. we could only always layer our prayers, our right and correct prayers for good outcomes with prayers for the glory of God and prayers for God's will to be done. We're praying about the future, about the building, and you know, phase two of the building. What if God gave us a choice? What if God said you can have a new building or you can have 500 new souls for Jesus Christ? I don't know where we'd put them, but what, what if God said that? Then our answer might be, might be, okay, Lord, we'll lay down that goal and take up your will, your better will. Who knows? Will you pray with us through that? Here at the end, i got two things, uh, two assignments. We're going to sing a very short little song. I like the verses, but they're not in in our hymnal, so we're just going to sing the chorus. Um, Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And then, uh, due to popular demand, once in a while we'll sing On Eagle's Wings again, and that's what we're going to sing as we leave. Just the chorus of On Eagle's Wings. Though I like the verses of that song too. Just choruses. My assignment for you is to take the big events you're facing right now. 
What is it that's driving you to your knees? What is it that you fear right now? What's looming on your horizon? Or what's happened that's brought, that's brought you to prayer? Take a moment and pray over that big event, whatever it might be, bad or good. Pray over it in all three ways. Ask God for the best outcome. Ask God to glorify himself through it. And then say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Okay? And if there's no big event right now in your life, I'm going to ask you to pray for the decisions and the directions that we go as a church. And put the big events of our new youth ministry and our new youth pastor who you will meet in a few weeks. Put that on your list. Pray that the three ways. Or our building dreams and plans. Put that into that prayer test. Everybody got that? Let's stand and sing the chorus. Before we follow the light of Jesus out into the world and before we fly away on eagle's wings, right? I want to I want to ask you to at, after we've done singing that, just take 20 seconds to pray. And there's one more possible big event you might should pray about. There might be one here, just one here who has never accepted Christ as their savior, right? That could be that's the biggest event of life. Why not today? If you are unsure about your eternal home or if you know that you've never said yes to Jesus, I just invite you to linger. I'm not going to go to the door today. I'm just going to stand here. And if anybody would like to pray over that issue or any other issue that's weighing on your heart, I'm just going to stay here to pray. Okay? Shall we fly away? Let's do it. And God will raise you up on eagles' wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the God bless everybody. Anybody wants prayer, I'll be right here. Adios.